Okay guys, welcome back to the channel. Gonna start my series on all the amazing things I referenced in the previous video that I did on my tour of Northern California recently. And again, I used the word amazing a lot in that preview video, but you're gonna start seeing as I start releasing this uh, material why amazing is really the only word that applies, the best adjective for everything that happened. And I'm gonna start it off with the Magico tour. Uh, many of you that are longtime subscribers will realize I did release a Magico tour video a while back when the guys from 3MA went there and took a video and shared it with me and I put it on the channel. I was supposed to go on that tour, but then a scheduling conflict came up. And so when Peter with Magico came down to Houston and was helping the guys at 3MA set up their M6s and their A5s, uh, he said that he and Alon wanted to invite me to come up at my convenience to Magico and take a tour uh, since I missed that prior one. And uh, certainly I wasn't going to pass that up and timed it well where I could visit some of my other uh, audiophile friends up there as well, which is going to be in other videos. But the Magico tour alone was enough to be make the tour, uh, the whole trip amazing. And for different reasons than you might suspect. Yes, the M9s, as you're going to see, amazing. I don't have music clips. I respect their preference to not have YouTube music clips of a speaker that quality. You're not going to be able to tell much, certainly the scale and stuff. So totally understand that part. But even what I came in with preconceptions and knowing a lot about Magico from 3MA, knowing Peter, going to shows many years, several things stood out. And what I was very happy uh, when I showed up there, I did watch one. A lot of people have come out there since I did that video and did other tours. And uh, I purposely didn't want to watch them and get preconditioned, except for I did watch um, the Absolute Sound went out there. And I did watch their interview just to see how professional press did it. And uh, I was happy to hear when I went out to meet with Alon that he wasn't interested in another sit down interview, covered all the basics, I think ad nauseum of his background and stuff like that. So watch those other videos if you are genuinely interested in that side of things. What I wanted to do, and he agreed, was um, to his liking as well, a more dynamic uh, video where you like you do at the shows. You come along with me during the tour. Things that pop out to me, I would ask about. He said he would welcome any tough questions and we'd make it more spontaneous like that. So you're going to basically come along on the tour with me with very minor editing, uh, along the way. And just to give you a heads up, what stood out to me, other than, of course, the M9s and the stuff that M Magico is known for, is quite a few other things uh, that surprised me. Even knowing a lot about Magico, the, it, I was still amazed and surprised by several things. So you're going to want to pay attention to the things that I point out and ask questions about and see if those things resonate with you as well. Because I don't think, although I haven't watched all the other videos, some of these things were noticed and brought to the attention that I think they deserve. Um, and also, what I told him in advance, I said, look, you're a, a luxury brand. And he totally agreed that it's more than just performance. It's quality control, uh, everything involved. And it, you're going to see even the level of photography that they do. Every little minute detail is at the highest level. And what I really appreciated, owning a business myself is what really resonated to me, and I wanted to make sure I get this across to you guys, is that there's a lot of businesses that are bigger than Magico and may have more money than Magico. And I was in that same boat when I started my business many years ago. And it's very tough to how do you compete with the big boys and get the reputation and business that they can get. And really, the, the motto that they have taken, and it, it showed through the tour clear as day what kind of things I look for in a business and also being a CPA and doing due, due diligence on many businesses for M&A work for many years I know this as well really impressed me is that they have this bespoke mindset and priority on the quality in every aspect of what they do over prioritizing fiscal <laughs> things and you know that's tough to do sometimes these big companies in the industry often they have bean counters they may have more technical resources or bigger space but nobody's going to beat magico on some of the things that they do with from the measurements to the uh cnc machines to the level of quality control to even the photography as i mentioned and even their stands play particular attention to that that wowed me um 
I think you're going to enjoy this video. They have the same kind of motto. I, my, my slogan in my business was big enough to serve, small enough to care. That really fits the Magico mindset. They're, they're quite big. I mean, it's a 30,000 square foot facility, well known in the industry. But I think you're still going to get that we care, small company vibe to them with these amazing resources. And that's a combination you don't often see and want the type of company you want to support. So again, kudos to Magico. Thank you for the tour, Alon. Without further ado, let's get started. Uh, it's a little museum space for us. Uh, some of the things that we've uh, done in the past and a little bit of our, little bit of our current work in progress. Um, for a number of years, we made these stacked Baltic birch enclosed speakers, uh, starting with the Mini, which is kind of really the speaker that made us into a company mm -hmm. back in uh, 2004, 2005, um, when Malone made uh, one for a, a custom build for a client and ended up taking it to CES to great acclaim and uh, kind of launched us off. Um, a lot of a lot of these, I most of these I built with my own hands in the in the late aughts. Um, but we've always been big proponents of aluminum as one of the ideal mediums for loudspeaker enclosure construction, as alone was kind of describing earlier on the S3. Um, and we've done some of our larger, hyper expensive products like that, like the original Ultimate Horns um, right. and our original Model 6. Um, but it wasn't until 2010 we were able to purchase our own CNC machine shop and uh, do our first all in house machine speaker from all aluminum, which was the Q5. Um, if you get it from look from this side, you can see the, the internal right, the intern. of it. Um, and when we launched this, it was about $50,000, but easily, um, had we had to outsource all this machine, it could have been three times the cost and just never would have come to fruition. Um, so from that point forward, we transitioned to doing everything from fully aluminum with a few copper elements um, and now with the new M series uh, incorporating aluminum sandwiched around carbon fiber. Um, this is our, this is our M rack equipment stand. Um, all aluminum copper constrained layer damped through each through each shelf. Uh, this one only has one shelf on it, but we offer this in three and four shelf variations. All constrained layer damped in each shelf, the feet, and the and the side struts. And the cable management as well is kind of nice. Cable management and uh, copper grounding, so you can ground, oh, is that right? ground each shelf and every piece of electronics uh, to this copper grounding rod. I have um, quite a few fans that or swear by that, so this is good to see. And I don't think a lot of people know you guys do these stands. Yeah, we don't uh, we don't push that. It's not our core business, but it's built the way our speakers are built. So in terms of uh, structure, uh, integrity, it's we feel the right way to. Uh, to do do you have it in different sizes or like mm -hmm. amp stands alone or? We have a th we have a three that's about it's about this height, uh, the four here, and we have two different sizes of amp stands. Okay, yeah. And, and you can just uh, just step on that. <laughs> yeah. Each one of those shelves, can... each one of those shelves is about eighty-five pounds. <laughs> this is impressive. I think a lot of people. I mean, I'm almost interested in this as well for yeah. amp stands. This is too tall, but I'd like to see. Uh, we have a three in the listening room okay. um, that you can check out. Um, this has always been kind of like one of the bedrocks for for our own R and D. We've always used them ourselves and. Only in the last few years started to uh, build them for clients. Very impressive, yeah. And, and when you hear the difference but when you start putting stuff mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on a stem like that, you'd be, you'd be shocked. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, Very it's, impressive. I don't know if you ever uh, played with our uh, <coughs> feet, with the uh, Q pods or M pods. Yeah, that's uh, impressive once Peter came out. Yeah. yeah. So this is like a huge M pod. Or a okay. Pod, you know, now everything kind of gets that when you put stuff on it. I started my channel exploring vibration control and doing A-B testing to find things that would do better. And so when I see things that, at least in my experience, make total sense, I like, yeah. So yeah, great job with that. But yeah, speakers. All right. <laughs> um, a few of our A3s, uh, just here waiting for, some, waiting for some tweeters to get installed shortly. Um, a lot of our uh, former and current S-series models, the S1 Mark II and the 
now discontinued us three more two mm -hmm. and the interior workings of our s5 and s7 yeah yeah i think one of my friends has the s7s that 3ma has in his home right now he's enjoying them they're beasts yes seven yeah are these the finishes representative of all the finishes or does yeah so we offer uh 12 different finishes for the s series um the six different colors of this more textured powder coat mm -hmm. and uh six colors of of high gloss paint um we can also do any any custom colors that you might like yeah impeccable look great Before we do our electronics QC, so any any driver crossover uh, before it goes into a speaker will come here and get tested um, on our clipable production analyzer. Um, similarly, any speaker on the way out the door, this will be their last step before going out to the final QC and packing. Um, clipable production analyzer allows us to set a very tight set of tolerances uh, based on a few references from uh, for any driver any complete speaker. And once those references are set, we'll be able to just uh, press one button and run a series of sweeps and it'll give us a clear pass or fail on between 10 and 15 different parameters depending on whether it's a single driver or a complete speaker. And we're in the, we're in the room right now, so we have a little, we have a little bit of noise. Uh, And so now we'll see that we're uh, at 100% pass for frequency response, impedance, um, all harmonic distortion, and any potential rub and buzz. We got one uh, microphone measuring the speaker and another in the ceiling canceling out any, any ambient rub noise. Yeah, so that's important to note. A lot of people don't think that measurements are important, but at least just for quality control alone, much less what these things can tell you about your design. Absolutely, and every every driver we design, we design and test to fit such a tight tolerance that we're not worrying about matching tweeters with one another because they're all measuring. They're all measuring. Just like one another. That's good to know. Yeah, if you if you bust a tweeter, you don't have to get a match pair again. That's good. And uh, I mean, I think people should notice that the clipple is not something that just everybody has. No. Um, to have that level of measurement, and you know, that's another level that a lot of manufacturers don't even pay uh, attention very, to. It's very rare for uh, someone um, kind of in our in our niche of ultra high end audio. Yeah. And we'll see uh, even more impressive uh, piece of their R&D equipment. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll be getting to shortly. All right, let's take a look then. Well, this is our packaging area. Uh, pretty quiet Monday here. We can't back in some of the, some of the acreages. Be the, nice. last, the last stop for uh, Cleaning and crating. Any okay. Of our, any of our larger speakers uh, will be crated up in these vertical uh, wooden crates. Uh, the door of the crate folds right down into yep. a ramp. ramp. So I, roll right out. I have a video on my channel where we've, we figured um, it out with a little help. Yeah. yeah. Um, pretty, pretty crucial. Very clever. Pretty crucial when you're unboxing 300 to 1,000 pound uh, speakers. Yeah. Um, so, as I was mentioning earlier about uh, our purchasing the CNC machine shop and how that allowed us to bring. Um, kind of machining all in house and be able to transition to fully aluminum speakers. Um, perhaps even more importantly is what it allowed us on the prototyping um, side of things. Um, prototyping a new speaker, how we had to outsource all this machining, each tiny little change, having to go through engineers outside machine shops can take weeks at a time. Sure. Here, we're able to go from a glimmer in Alone's eye onto an engineer's computer into a digital model um, and then programmed for a CNC machine and then into a physical part, sometimes within just the course of hours. So it allows us to try dozens or hundreds of different things that in the time span that we would be able to choose right. one if we were doing this through, through outside vendors. A lot of people overlook that, but, you know, Alon's obviously a brilliant guy, but there's no substitute for being able to trial and error, experiment. Mm -hmm. And if you have to go through all this stuff to just do one trial, mm -hmm. you, there's going to be a limit of what you can achieve. So having both the brains to come up and deliver is a huge advantage. And now we have a lot more uh, new R&D equipment that's kind of showing us exactly 
exactly what's going on with the speaker. Um, That's great. Yeah. Independent from from the room and surroundings. This is our CNC shop. Okay. Uh, there's four uh, four mills and a and a lathe here. There's any of our turn parts, uh, tension rods, some of our, our feet items. Um, here we're just doing some of the internal parts, um, starting off as, as this little block and then turn it into one of these uh, base driver uh, mounting rigs for the M3. These are quite large CNC machines. Yeah, so they get kind of larger. You know, <laughs> yeah. This these are our wow. pieces too, so any of our, any of our larger uh, pieces will go um, on these guys. Uh, as you can see, the, the spindle stays in one place while the, while the table moves. Yeah, these are not cheap. No, not at all. <laughs> this uh, is a lot of money in here. But this allows us to do kind of the, the, largest, the largest pieces that we do. Uh, some of the very large M9 parts and the, the M6 space parts. And it'll take anywhere from say 10 minutes for one of those rings up to about 13 hours for some of the larger M9 parts. Wow. We do, we do incorporate some copper elements. So um, in the case of the M3 and M6 and M9, we them out the mid-range to, to a copper ring. Really? Um, okay. It's a copper gasket. Has copper better, gasket. Has better damping characteristics. Really? Okay. So it's not just aesthetic. You got a, a intentional. No, it's not aesthetic. You don't see. You don't see this. <laughs> well, that's true. You the way you've got it. That's true. So yeah, it's purpose. Absolutely. That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, we're we're filling up both these dumpsters full of aluminum chips about every four to five days. Uh, really. Minus what we're taking out on the soles of our shoes. Uh, it's, all, it's all getting melted down and recycled, so we're pretty much as close to a zero waste shop as you can get. Really? Yeah, you won't see this in many manufacturing in any audio file company. With the A series, um, they're all either black or clear anodized. Saw the silver A5 out there, and then with the S series as I mentioned, we have 12 different finishes. So those will stock uh, raw aluminum parts out here, um, waiting for your choice of finish for us to send out. And the M series is all all black and black and carbon fiber. So this is the S5 Mark II top plate. Interesting. So, I was mentioning our new uh, R&D equipment. Uh, this is the Clipple NFS near field scanner. Okay. Uh, wow. So, this is this is a robot that rotates, uh, rotates three, around 360 yeah. degrees around the speaker. Yeah. Um, we'll measure anywhere from about 2,000 to 4,000 different points. And what we're doing is taking two cylinders of measurement offset by a few inches. And by analyzing the difference between those, we're able to see exactly what the speaker is doing without any interference from the surroundings. Um, had we had to do this in an anechoic chamber, for each one of these measurements that we run over the course of about 12 hours, it would take one one technician setting up each one of these points probably three or four weeks to do one measurement mm -hmm. um, and for every new speaker we'll measure each individual driver and the full speaker with the crossover so this is many many months of anechoic chamber time that we take well you need to find a big enough anechoic chamber too for all the frequencies a big enough anechoic yeah. chamber and the anechoic chamber is really not going to show you what's going on at really low at low frequencies. No, this is a this is a huge advantage. I, I hope people understand that this type of measurement system is a huge advantage. Um, because yeah, you can't even do it with anechoic chambers. What? You can. I, I'm not. I'm not even aware. Perhaps there is one. The Seattle one. one the one people way up there. Yeah. To do, um, Twenty hertz, but. Yeah. It has to be so huge. We have no access to any, not, not just us, nobody, nobody does, yeah. Has access to something like that. It's all military stuff. 
Yeah, and you're getting a head up. Even if they did do it now, you're using it and translating it to your audibility. So you're getting that wisdom just, just come through experience. So yeah. this is impressive, yeah. And while it's not set up today, uh, the other crucial piece of equipment that we've gotten recently is our scanning vibrometer. Vibrometer, okay. Um, so what it allows us to do is uh, shoot a laser at the, at the side of the speaker. Uh, we'll set up a digital grid of anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand points. Mm -hmm. um, and then it'll give us uh, um, a digital animation of how much activity we're getting at every point in the speaker. And then so you play like pink noise through the speaker or something, and then you just figure out, yeah. okay. Um, and yeah, it'll give us an animation of how much the, the speaker is. Uh, we should, uh, can we show, can we get you here to uh, plug in and show the uh, differences, the animation? Yep. Let's do that. While we, I mean, we let, let's get him on, and we can continue to walk and come back here. Okay. You want to call him? Or yeah. You guys want to go do GC and A series? All right. I'll do that. Then you All guys right. will set it up. Uh, also, uh, bring the clipper uh, screen as well, so we can show you all the new things. Uh, uh, let me show you small parts over there. Okay. Now, do you find when you're running the pink noise for vibrations now? At different volumes, does it excite different resonances, or? Yeah, of course, the volume yeah. is, uh, is a factor, but uh, it's not it's not pink noise, but it's uh, it, it's, it, it's that kind of noise. Okay. Uh, Especially for that purpose. Yeah, yeah. but uh, what well, it's basically generating the entire spectrum. Uh, so you can test it at different volumes and see. It, yeah, but the end results that you get are always uh, correlating to uh, it's. Uh, What's the word I'm looking uh, for? Um, it's a relative measurement. So you could see what the speakers are doing regardless of what the SPL is. It just takes the oh, SPL okay. and it divided, divided by the movement of the, uh, of the structure itself. Oh, interesting. So it can predict yeah, so, at different volumes. Yeah, okay. so even at low volume, you can actually see the movement. It's just not going to be as right. exaggerated. Right. It's not, it's gonna, not gonna you divide it. divided by the amount of uh, uh, voltage you put in. So you'll get a picture at the end that shows you what the box will do regardless of what frequency well, uh, again, you'll be playing it. If you don't have that tool and you're just a manufactured doing a speaker you don't know when you're going to excite that resonance unless you're playing it loud enough but you're able to predict it exactly that's a huge benefit because the worst thing about a lot of speakers is a resonance yeah absolutely. that's audible absolutely. and then you're like but again with speakers that are built from mdf or any 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 type of composite uh you you cannot necessarily do anything about these resonances because what would happen is if you add another brace, mm -hmm. you're adding also mass. So you, you over, you, you're damping even more what you're trying to stiffen. Mm -hmm. So yes, it will increase the stiffness like this, but it will increase the dampness like that. Right. So you're adding more mass, you're increasing the energy storage that the structure has, and you actually, you're smearing the cue of the movement. Mm -hmm. So if the movement was more pointy before, you took it down, but now it's wider. Ringing. So you're just that, yeah. moving. It rings less, but now it's stretched across wider, A wider frequency. frequency range. Yeah. And that's where the, the, the energy is, is being stored. So you're playing music, and you know a while later, this music is coming back mm -hmm. <laughs> at a different tone, much lower level. So that is where aluminum comes in place, where you could actually you could see where the uh, resonant is and you can add a brace which adds uh, negligible dampness but increases the stiffness and I'll, I'll you'll see okay what it looks like so you will realize how effective these things are these are all small parts we have to machine all this here I mean it's, it's thousands of parts that you know battens and there's uh, aluminum gaskets of course you saw the copper gaskets uh, these are the materials that are used for constrained layer damping. Okay. You can see there's different um, thickness to them. They are, when we're done measuring the structure and see where the resonances are, we create these custom um, damping um, platforms that are actually dialed into the specific frequencies that the structure is resonating in. Is that right? So this is damping those frequencies, um, uh, focusing on those, and basically creating uh, heat out of the vibration 
that is going through them. So it's a constrained layer damping. You take the two uh, elements. Uh, I'll, I'll show you uh, inside uh, how it's done on the faceplate. Um, that basically capture the vibration of the structures and dissipate it to heat. And this is how constrained layer damping is done. So is it done by different thicknesses? How you to target it's different, different yes. frequencies? Okay. Different thicknesses and also um, density. And so I, I assume you use this and those stands that I'm very interested in. Exactly. So yes. you you just pick a normal, general thickness for that purpose. In the stand, it's just one thickness. Okay. Yeah, because it's a very simple kind of a squarish uh, apparatus. But in the speakers, it's uh, that's it's pretty impressive. Thickness. You can target. Yeah. A lot of people just put the same kind of right. no res yeah, or whatever. Uh, yeah. They're, they're in different thicknesses. You can that's impressive. Here. This is a thinner one. You can see it here. Uh, yeah. That's a used for the as well. <laughs> These are things that people should not overlook. The, this level of detail mm -hmm. is what a lot of companies overlook yeah. or can't do. Yeah. That's well, great that's, to know. Uh, that's science, you know? Well, yeah. <laughs> For, for anyone who dismisses science and measurement, and no, it's the end, it's all science. Yeah, in the past, if you had British speakers, they just work with the resonances to the best yeah, they can, they, but they never had the technology exactly. or the know-how yeah, and science. Because they didn't have... They don't have, have what you have now. They don't have a Nobody would go back to doing it that yeah. way. It's not only it. that, it's a lot more expensive. So that's That's something. true, this that's true. The, uh, so called downside to that. Sure, it's sure. It's not cheap. Um, but when you see what goes into these speakers and the, the amount of uh, investment not just in machinery and tools but just knowledge and mm -hmm. time it takes to do all these things uh, you could see the value right so so yes it's expensive but look what you're getting for your money yeah well I'm glad people are getting to see a little bit more than just aluminum magico you know cool no, 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 there's no, a lot no, more no. science yeah. behind it yeah. great good easier to call me back Okay. Set it up. Um, so I'll go see next door and then come in here. You want to talk about this stuff here? Or? Uh, so uh, basically all the internals um, that Alone just showed you, um, our inventory controller will kit up either one or two pairs of speakers, kind of depending on the model, onto one of these racks. In the case of an M9, it takes a few racks. Um, but ideally, when one of our uh, assembly technicians is done with their current build, they just come out here, grab the next rack, and they should really have everything they need to complete their next pair of speakers without leaving their station. Gotcha. I want to show uh, that an M3 crossover. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, people see the internals of the... Uh, but rarely do they see... <laughs> One of these coil has more money into it than many other two fully crossover. Sure, yeah, a whole crossover together. design. Yes, this is wow. I mean, pick it up. <laughs> See how much I need two hands, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a serious crossover. So, but when you see when you see an expensive speaker with uh, a coil. That goes. This is a base, uh, base driver coil, with a coil that has uh, an iron core in it, which is typically that's what you see. Uh, so you see like a um, rectangular a coil. Mm -hmm. that is, inductor. The, the coil yeah. is the inductor is is is, is uh, rolled over some sort of a ferret. Uh, mm -hmm. What happened to coils like that is that they get saturated very quickly. So two or three volts, it's fine, but when it says eight volts, it, it's saturated, it's no longer working. So it's no longer acting, it's, not, it's no longer doing what it's supposed to do to begin with, what the design purpose of that coil was supposed to do. All right. So distortion goes through the roof. Uh, the, the actual uh, roll off, the target that you uh, designated for the drivers are gone because it's no longer acting as, 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 uh, as an inductor. And, uh, you know, there's speakers out there that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. that using these kind of... Uh, you don't even get air core inductors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like you're talking but, about, yeah. But uh, an inductor like this, uh, uh, a ferrite inductor like that, would cost uh, $20, $30. 
and that's the difference we're, we're talking about. Huge difference in price, yeah. Now, how is this mounted? In the, it's so heavy. Is it at the base, or how do you it's make sure? Base, okay, yeah, because base. you wouldn't want to. Yeah. No, no, you don't want it hanging anywhere. Yeah, that would. It, uh, it, we might be able to see. How okay, these yeah. Are mounted. It, it has these uh, legs that are holding it together. It's okay. All bolted, and it's uh, and you can see how it's held together. So. Uh, yeah, multiple This is strap. experience too, you know. Yeah, because <laughs> probably shipping, you like probably that. had a few of those come off yeah. in the past. Yeah. I mean, with shipping, it it never ends. It doesn't matter how well you, you protect stuff. Sometimes yeah, it's right. like, my God, did they just drop this from the airplane or somebody? <laughs> Ten foot falls, had, yeah, sometimes, yeah. Seven that showed up uh, at, at uh, went to Japan. It showed up at the uh, customer home and it looked fine, but nothing was working. We start looking into it. They open it up. Everything inside was shattered. I mean, the magnets of the drivers were broken off the structure of the, the, the basket. I mean, it must have been dropped from, I don't know, maybe five, six foot. To yeah, off of something. a forklift fell off. Yeah, that's what they, they do. I mean, yeah. they kind of lower it, and sometimes they drop it too fast, and it just... So when you look at it, it's like, oh, it's perfect, but inside it's... Disaster, yeah. I've had the same thing happen to my speakers with much smaller inductors than this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but now all our heavy stuff is also, I don't know if you've seen, but it's, it's travel on, on cushioning. Okay. Uh, rather, so the whole thing is kind of floating. So we have very little um, shipping damage lately, very mm -hmm. little. And if we do, it's typically if a forklift goes through a box, so right. you can see it. You don't have to guess. You can see, okay, this, uh, this was Yeah, done the crating was very impressive with the S7s I watched unbox. So, yeah, that's great. We have very, very low, very low uh, issues with shipping these days. But it took, it took years to get to that point. Okay. All right, let's, okay. let's go to the, uh, let's continue. Yeah, just go to QC and A-series. No, we're almost okay. there. Yeah, it's Monday, so this area is a bit uh, quiet. Gotcha. And, uh, by Thursday, there is uh, quite a bit more action here. All right, so this is, uh, this is where we do a lot of the intake. Uh, by the way, these are, you know, big aluminum plates, stuff that's going to get machined okay. eventually. Uh, this is where we do QC for um, outside vendor uh, products, like all our carbon fiber. We don't do these in-house. Everything comes in here and goes through a meticulous uh, QC. Okay. Um, do some polishing here as well. Um, see M9. All these are M9s, the yeah. Uh, structure is put on them. Look at the thickness of the carbon. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, it's really important to have a high level of quality control, as I've seen recently. Not naming other brands, but this is an important aspect of any facility to have Absolutely. a high level of quality control. I mean, these are very expensive products, and unlike even cars, they are in your living room. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that you can get away with uh, in cars. Yeah, out in your garage. You can, yeah. yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, uh, well, these are not uh, clean yet, but. If you look at all our carbon work, um, it's uh, it's completely transparent. When you look at a car uh, roof um, carbon uh, work, it's it's about 20% opaque. They put some uh, um, a bit of a dark color in the clear, You're so right. it would hide any defect. You're right. This is much clearer. It's, it's almost like clear, yeah. you can see my reflection in yeah. it, which the opaqueness of others right. it would block that. Right. Which, See, okay. uh, which really drives our vendor crazy because they cannot have any faults in the actual carbon layout, which is extremely difficult. This is really beautiful, yeah. Now that you point it out, that is impressive. Yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way in my living room. You know? No, kudos, yeah, <laughs> definitely. In my garage, maybe, but in the living room, right. no. 
No, it's much more than just performance when you're talking about high end. It's about everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And this is before we put all the metal in it, etc. Is this the reference Logitech? <laughs> <laughs> This is what your baseline. Yeah, this is this is this goes into the M9. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell yeah, yeah. The secret sauce is right here. <laughs> All right. Cool. Let's, uh, let's These are M6s. Okay. And the M6s, you could see, this is solid carbon. Solid. Yeah, this is all solid. Wow. Carbon. I mean, it's layered, but this is one piece. Uh, it's all carbon. Mm. There's no uh, fiberglass or any other kind of. Uh, yeah. So that combination. You're probably unique in doing that kind of. Um, I think so. Yeah. I, think I don't so. think anybody else is no, even. Typically, uh, it's some sort of a combination of a core. And a skin, which we do with the M9, but we do it with aluminum honeycomb. Gotcha. 